here we go. Okay, hello everybody and welcome back to the show. Today we have a very, very special guest, Catherine Valancourt. Thank awesome. you for thank you for joining us. Um, this is this is going on with the the SciCom Canada 2020 series. You are attending this virtual conference. I am, and I'm very excited. Yeah. So this is sort of the the before, and hopefully we can get a, an after interview to see you know how we've changed and grown. Mm -hmm. But uh, but maybe maybe you could introduce uh, what you do outside of SciCom first. You're, sure. You're in Quebec, is that correct? I am, yeah. I'm at McGill in Montreal. I'm an eighth year PhD student. So basically, they're trying to kick me out, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm very long in the PhD process. But uh, I study epigenetics and addiction. So basically, um, I work in a lab that uses post-mortem human brain subjects or human brain samples. So people who, who died of their illness and, and donated their samples. And I look at changes to the molecule of DNA in people who died of cocaine addiction compared to controls to try to see how their brain cells are functioning differently, essentially. Interesting. Um, yeah. I'm not a, a big bio guy, but uh, mm -hmm. ex epigenetics really, like the idea of it stuck in my head as far back as I think high school. I feel like when I was first hearing about it, the textbooks would say something like, we're not sure if it's a real thing or it wasn't clear that this was like a thing that could happen. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the fact that you, ha you heard about it in high school is pretty amazing. I mean, I didn't hear about it until, well, basically until at the end of my undergrad. And I was like, what do I want to do? Do I want to go to grad school? Do I want to work? Uh -huh. And I was looking at labs and I was like, what is this? Yeah. I feel like it was mentioned in passing, but, yeah. uh, but the idea that um, like something that could happen within your lifetime could significantly alter your mm -hmm. your your dna i guess yeah pretty much so i mean like every cell in your body has the same dna has the same chromosomes right mm -hmm. but of course a brain cell and a heart cell and a skin cell all look and behave very differently and so that's epigenetics which basically turns certain genes on and off at certain times and for certain you know lengths of time so that the cell can produce just what it needs essentially to do its job um, which happens during differentiation as you sort of develop as a, as a fetus, as a person. But the brain is, is super cool. And you're right in that it only has only been about 10, well, this is 10 years since I've been doing it. So it's only been about like 20, 25 years that people have really noticed that like, oh wait, brain cells use epigenetics to modify how they respond to the environment and how they interact with each other. And yeah, even, Things, you know, like early life trauma can cause changes in your epigenetic signature in certain brain cells that change how you respond to things oh. way later in life. Interesting. Yeah, the example mm -hmm. that I always think about is um, uh, places that have, you know, had like one generation worth of famine or something like that. Yeah. Um, that's the example that I think I was told about. But you are looking more into brain chemistry um, cocaine yeah. addiction and stuff. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's definitely the, like the, one of the extreme examples, but I think uh -huh. the more we look at it, the more we realize that like, even just like everyday learning stuff, like, you know, learning a new route to, route to get to school or meeting a new person and learning their name, like that all changes the epigenetic signatures as well. So in my case, like those are the kind of processes that you need as a person or as a thing with a brain <laughs> to function in your environment. But those are the same kind of processes that can cause somebody to go from like casually taking a drug like cocaine to like the habitual constant thinking about and seeking the drug and that kind of behavior. So it's not necessary. I don't necessarily look at it from like the actual pharmacolo pharmacology of a cocaine molecule on a brain cell, but more like what that downstream change of the way the cell behaves, how that changes and turns into a, an addiction. Itself. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, any, any, I think so too. <laughs> anything brain related just blows my brain. Um, <laughs> so as far as uh, the, the kind of research that you do, you're, I'm guessing in the lab, you're doing experiments mm -hmm. on um, what, yeah. what, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. Good question. So uh, yeah, I move a lot of clear liquids between tubes. 
Okay. Well, yes. <laughs> so, well, so, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the first thing, I mean, the first thing I had to do is make a little, so we have, like I said, brain donations. So people will donate their, their tissue or the families of people who pass away will donate their tissue. <laughs> so we take little tiny chunks of it and extract the DNA and extract the RNA. And so we can, I can do a lot of DNA sequencing to see um, differences at that level. I do a lot of RNA, um, like PCR. So like seeing how much certain transcripts are in different cells. Um, Even like studying how different proteins attach to the DNA and how that changes. Um, One of my more, well, I think is kind of cool. One of my more exciting experiments is I was looking at how um, how like the three dimensional structure of the DNA changes in response to cocaine dependence. So like when you see a picture of a nucleus in a textbook, it's like a massive spaghetti, right? But I think it's so cool that there's actual like functionality in that three dimensional form yeah. and that that can change in response to stuff too. And that changes how genes are expressed and like, yeah. So that's, oh man. That, yeah. I've just started to learn about that because uh, it actually turns out that the, the physics that I do in the lab has mm-hmm. some application to like the three dimensional structure. Yeah. Like this is as one of these things where as I was learning about it, I mean, there's this whole physics side of it. Like I realized that there's so like physis- physicists, it's hard for me to say, physicists have been looking at DNA from this other point of view for this whole time. And we just found out a way to look at it in the lab. Mm-hmm. To be like, oh yeah, you guys are right. It does have like <laughs> all the <laughs> confirmed two dimensional uh, stuff. Yeah, like yeah. forces that pull it this way and that way. Yeah, it's, super cool. I I love that stuff. Um, shoot, I was I was gonna ask you something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you were saying that you you actually use uh, donated samples and everything. Mm-hmm. Um. So as far as uh, doing like a. Oh, Amazon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, as far as uh, doing experiments, is it more like um, characterizing large quantities of people with like a known history and then categorizing stuff? Or do you like take some of these samples and like, I'm going to do this to it and see how it responds? Mm. D- does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So since the samples we, ha- we get, they are, I mean, the person's passed away so the tissue the tissue is dead mm-hmm. so we can't um we can't really manipulate the tissue itself so it's more of like a study of, of what's different about it compared to controls okay so um large samples we have as many samples as we can but of course it's, it's a pretty uh, it's pretty rare resource right it's, it's a yeah. big ask to ask people <laughs> like hey your son father husband daughter whatever just died of cocaine overdose can we have their brain and also ask you these like super extensive questions about everything they've ever done in their life? Like, cause you got to do it fast too. Right. And right. Yeah, so it's a big ask. So we don't have a ton of samples, a ton of tissue. Mm-hmm. Well, the brain bank in general has been going on. So I work at the brain bank here in Verdun in Montreal and we have over 3000 samples now, but it's been going on for decades. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. It's been going on for a long time, but what we look for, like, you know, certain criteria for each experiment. So like I, I'm looking for people who had cocaine dependence, but I don't necessarily want to have people that were also dependent on opioids or right. benzodiazepines or things like that, that could just confound my situation. So um, the numbers can be kind of limited, but we, what we look for the differences that exist there. And then we can go to cells or animals or something like that to do the actual, like, ah. what if I change this? How does that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Verdun has a brain bank. I didn't know that. I know, right? <laughs> and it's like the biggest one in Canada. Wow. Yeah. It's I would. Cool. I'd like to be able to say that I work at the brain bank. It, it, I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's got a certain ring to it. Yeah, you're, you're one of the brains at the brain bank, but. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the worst place to be if zombies ever happen. I'm getting oh, out of there. Oh yeah, true. Yeah, it, but. Do, do they need living brain? Like a, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Well, we got some frozen ones. Anyway, point is... Brain yeah. signal. That's, that's <laughs> brain nice. signal, exactly. <laughs> cool. That's really... Uh, that's exciting. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah. okay. So, so that's what you do in nine to five, quote unquote, although grad student grad hours school, are never really... 
<laughs> it's yeah for me at least it's never actually between nine and five it's only outside of those times it seems like yeah yeah it's when you're not but, expecting it to be but yeah but uh the other stuff that you're passionate about um well one of the other things you seem to be passionate about is science communication yeah absolutely and uh that has inspired you to uh apply and attend this uh SciComm conference yeah can you tell me a little bit about your interest in, in SciComm? Um, I guess the question I, I never really know how to ask, but I'll try to ask it is, do you see yourself as like a scientist who wants to become a good science communicator to like be a better scientist? Or are you interested in being like a science communicator who has science training, but like, do you see where I see yeah. I'm sort of going with that? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. Basically, you're asking me, do I want to stay in academia? Am I going to do the science forever? Yeah. Um, I definitely see myself more as a, well, I like see myself in my future more as like a communicator with science training. Okay. And so I think once you're trained as a scientist, you're never, you're never not a scientist. You know, like you're always going to have that same approach, that sort of scientific, or, you know, almost scientific approach to things. Mm -hmm. Um. So I definitely want to transition more into science communication as a main focus. Um, I also probably, I see myself even like further down the line doing research on science communication methods and things oh. like that as well. But um, yeah, it's kind of in this, uh, you know, I mean, as you, as you definitely know, science communication is such a broad thing mm -hmm. that it could be like, I don't, I don't know what the job's going to be like. I don't know where I'm going to end up, but. I know it's not in the lab, so there's that. <laughs> right. You know that you want to be around science. You want yes. to communicate it in some, in some way. Mm -hmm. and so you just smash those two words together and... Uh, Somebody pay me, please. And please pay me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Um, it seems, I mean, I'm kind of in the same boat. I feel like a lot of us who are going to this uh, conference are in the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, not exactly sure what the uh, career trajectory is, but uh, almost going to this thing to see what is available. Is that yeah. a fair characterization, you think? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's funny because like academia trains you specifically for a very specific like career track, right? Mm -hmm. Like the end goal of all of this is to be a PI with a lab. But I think most of us end up in non- academic careers and it's just so much like you know this lateral movement there's all kinds of things people can like create jobs for themselves and end up freelancing and being like hey here's my skill set and people will pay me for it so it's a uh, it's a lot more a lot of more question marks but um i actually went to the flagship comms icon this year as well oh that just happened right yeah which was amazing um and it's nice to see I mean, it's nice to see people who, you know, who have careers in science communication and have their advice. But honestly, the best part of it for me was seeing other grad students who were super psyched on SciComm and had all these cool ideas. And it was just, yeah, it's crazy. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, do you want to, maybe, maybe you could tell me a little bit more about what happened. I didn't go to the flagship one, so I'm, I'm trying mm -hmm. to, I'm trying to figure it out uh, secondhand. What, what, yeah. kind of, what kind of panels did they have? Um, it was super cool. So we had... Um, the first one was like science communication in the age of COVID-19. Okay. So it was talking about, you know, how to combat misinformation and all of that. Uh, we had panels on equity and diversity and inclusion and accessibility, which was really, really cool. Um, we had panels on, we had a zine. Okay. The one that stuck with me the most was a, a comic and zine workshop. So like, how to oh, yeah, how to make zines and comics and like resources and places you can pitch. Oh, it's very, very cool. Oh, I love um, that. Mm -hmm. We had a storytelling with data panel. Yeah, it was very cool. And a lot of, um, yeah, so it was surprising because, you know, it's virtual again. So I wasn't sure how connected we'd all be able to be, but we had a surprising amount of time to get to know yeah. each other and, sort of mingle yeah i mean it clearly wasn't as um what's the word it wasn't as personal as it could have been you know i feel but, like hands-on isn't quite the word but it gets the yeah yeah <laughs> the exactly across. yeah 
have no hands on these days. No. <laughs> That's really cool. Those are, um, those sort of panels sound like the exact kind of thing that I would be interested in. So, yeah. Especially the zine stuff. Are, are you a big zine person? Well, I think I'm going to be now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I wasn't really before, but I'm like, hold on. Like, I could probably do this. Like, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I haven't seen a lot of uh, science-based ones. A lot of the times, they're, the ones that I've come across have been sort of like uh, like uh, mental health type things or like uh, mm -hmm. accessibility and acceptance of, you know, your the way that you interact with the world and things like that, like personal mm -hmm. journal type things. Mm -hmm. But uh, just the fact that you can be so casual and open and visual in that sort of medium, it seems like it's yeah. a, a no-brainer that you can jump to, to doing science and mm -hmm. keep like a personal narrative in there, which is like a key to keeping people interested. Oh yeah, for sure. I just wish I could draw. <laughs> well, so that's the thing, right? I also cannot draw. Worth a damn, really. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the, you know, the idea of like collage, like digital collage instead. So like just taking chunks of pictures from things. Okay. Yeah. 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 Together. I mean, there we go. Now you don't have to draw. There you go. Let somebody else draw for you. <laughs> True. Yeah. Just finding, I guess that's, uh, that's what you got to do. You got to sit down and mess around and find your medium. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Well, maybe, maybe I know what I'm doing for the rest of quarantine. Maybe. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that, uh, and how long was the, the flagship one? It was three was, days. Three days. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they had it, so it started at noon Eastern time. So it was like noon to five every day for the three okay. days. But yeah, it, like on paper, I was like, this was going to be a lot of zooming, but I don't like maybe just because I really liked it I was just like super into it like 11.55 I'm like come on cyclone <laughs> that's cool yeah and I guess uh not having to travel and all of that stuff you probably didn't experience the the post-conference burnout the same way yeah well that's true so the benefit definitely is like being able to like just fall back in your own bed and chill yeah um so yeah it wasn't quite the same um, it's a little bit different in terms of like expectations of like normally if you travel through a conference like you don't put the expectation on yourself either you know people don't expect you necessarily to be like on the rest of your work like this right because you're mm -hmm. traveling um, but like a digital conference is kind of different like people are sometimes like well but you're home so why aren't you doing right, the thing right you know answer my email <laughs> yeah exactly I'm busy <laughs> pretty much yeah, yeah. true I um I started getting really interested in um seeing how conferences are adapting to the virtual setting. Mm -hmm. Um and that was one of the things that I, I thought initially was a, a pro. Like uh um this big conference I was supposed to go to got canceled uh pretty early on. And so it was nice that I could attend the talks that I wanted to and then go back into the lab for the talks that mm -hmm. weren't really applicable and that seemed like a pro, but uh I don't know. You really do have to be there for... <laughs> yeah, the one thing that I think really we missed out on virtually was, like, typically when you're at a conference, you're having meals together, there's, like, the in-between time where you're catching up and getting coffee, and, like, yeah. just those, like, small, casual connections you make with people that kind of build up over time. Um, yeah, those are the things that I think definitely are missing when you go virtual, but mm -hmm. it's definitely better than nothing, so... Yeah. Yeah, so um, now you are, you know, launching into uh, another round of SciComm conferencing, but uh, yeah. not for not for a while. We got about a month, mm -hmm. but uh, leading up to it, I'm not sure if listeners are aware. Um, they give us they give us homework leading up to it. Yeah. Uh, so we just had a deadline pass. Um, actually two deadlines passed. We had to write a sort of a, a little article or an infographic or some sort of communication based thing. And I believe today was the deadline to submit your edits, peer edits. That's or a was, good reminder. I was do that, not yeah. remember. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should uh, definitely do that today if it's the deadline. Yeah. Uh, honestly, time these days is yeah, all it, over the place. Yeah. So it's, 
purely mm. referential to other people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so we weren't in the same editing group, but uh, can I maybe uh, get a spoiler about uh, what you decided oh, to write about? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so, okay. I got really excited a little while ago when a couple papers came out that showed, so neurotransmitters, like the molecules that communicate between brain cells, the paper showed that those molecules can actually get inside the nucleus and change how genes are expressed as well. Like oh. neurotransmitters, oh, they also don't just transmit. Sometimes they just go in there and control the entire cell. <laughs> Amazing. So yeah, so I decided to write about that as sort of like an excitement explainer kind of piece. Mm -hmm. um, and I was trying to think of like, what's the best way to set that up? Like, what's the best way to hook and explain, like get people excited the way I'm excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I went with like a life hack kind of article. You know how many listicles you see? Like you know, yeah, amazing yeah. life hack. So I went with a sort of like, your brain's been doing this crazy life hack with neurotransmitters and you didn't even know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see how that turns out. But That sounds really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this this sounds groundbreaking. This, yeah, I yeah, I guess again, I don't know too much about bio stuff, but uh, it's big. Yeah, I, I've never heard of such a thing, and that. Yeah, I hadn't either, and like I'm all up in the field, right? Like, yeah, I, that's crazy. Yeah. Where did so, it get published? Sure. Um, so it actually came out in two papers. Okay. Uh, one was in Nature, one was in Science. Okay, that makes sense. Yep, <laughs> exactly. I also haven't seen it in like any like science news stuff maybe my, maybe my feed is not focused on sciencey stuff these days but mm -hmm. i feel like it has it been reported on by uh um by like uh scientific american or anything like that that's a good question i'm not sure i'm not sure so i <laughs> subtle plug for myself uh i wrote about them a little bit in so i write for an online uh publication called epigenie which is about epigenetics news essentially so i wrote about it there uh, okay. but it's, I mean, that's not scientific American. <laughs> it's much more niche than that. Um, so I think there's been like, you know, a little couple press releases and things like that, but I don't know if it's been. I feel like you yeah. could pitch that to scientific American and. Oh my gosh. I didn't think of that. You should do it. I should do it. That would be cool. That would be very cool. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think they'll like almost certainly pick it up for their, their blog, their blog mm -hmm. stuff and they pay pretty well. Really? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Well, this is exciting. Yeah. I like this idea. Do it. Do it. <laughs> Peer pressure. My only weakness. Okay. <laughs> My only weakness is that I am weak. <laughs> uh, that yeah, Gosh. that's a, that's awesome. Um, did you yeah, see any cool. during your during your edits and stuff like that? If you've gotten into it a little bit, did you see anything particularly creative from your peers? Yeah, I noticed, so I kind of snooped in the overall file, just a little bit. Yeah. Kind of good at snooping. You're supposed to, and I, I think. love Yeah, and I love how many people went with pictures, like infographics and yeah. things like that. Yeah, it's very cool. Like the idea of communicating graphically is something that I'm trying to explore a lot more too. Mm -hmm. I want to gain my, like grow my skills, but also... Um, as a way to express things that you can't even express properly in writing or you can't catch somebody the same way as you can with, with pictures. So yeah, I was excited to see a lot of infographics. Um, those are, just, those are hard to critique in my mind. Well, yeah. Um, for a couple of reasons, like I think personally, like I don't have as much experience in that medium. So I'm like, I don't know if I can give much advice, but, Mm -hmm. I also know that I like it's so much like it's a whole different game making pictures of things. Like, how do you even do that? I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. I had one infographic in my pool, um, and basically, kind of the only comment I could have was like, "I'm not exactly sure where you want my eyes to go." Mm -hmm. Like, there's there's information in pockets, and it's all it seems like it can stand alone. It doesn't yeah. have to go in a sort of sequence. I'm not sure if you're going for like that kind of sequential mm -hmm. thing, but I don't know, something to think about. Yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah. Don't know. yeah, pretty much. Like in, in my case, I'd just be like, as a person who's not familiar with this at all, 
this is what I'm left wondering, or this is what, right. you know, I think might fill in a gap or something, but mm -hmm. yeah. I guess with like an writing. infographic, you really have to know what the audience is and if there's going to be like a call to action of some sort, maybe. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you hoping to achieve with the graphic? That was another thing I was a little bit confused about. I wasn't sure if it was just like a for your information kind of situation or if it was mm -hmm. like, because of this, you have to go and do this thing. Like, is it an infographic that's going to be in a bus enclosure? telling mm -hmm. like the average person that you should go get tested for whatever yeah but i don't know yeah. it's a uh, yeah something i have no experience with either did you see any of the uh, children's books i feel like there was a couple <gasps> children's books oh no i haven't okay i had I one in my oh uh, that's so cool in my pool yeah it was awesome <laughs> did they like it was there pictures and words there were um there were some partial pictures not fully fleshed out but uh yeah it was a pretty cute story. Um, you should dip into my folder and, and check it mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can send you a Absolutely. link afterwards. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was, it was nice. Um, That's very cool. Yeah. And so I guess there's one other piece of homework that uh, w was optional. Uh, are you making a poster? That's a great question. So I made one for the flagship workshop. Okay. And I suppose I could resubmit it. But I don't think I'm going to this time. I think I will, like what I missed out while like presenting my poster was interacting with other people and their stuff. Um, and so I think I want to use the opportunity this time to see what other people are up to and kind of okay. explore that a little bit. But it, it, yeah, it's cool. Okay. What was yeah. your, can I ask what your poster yeah, was? Yeah, for sure. So I'm part of an organization based here in Montreal called the Convergence Initiative. Okay. So um, basically the idea is to bring science, well, neuroscience, but science in general, and art together to make both better, pretty much. So there's a whole bunch of different um, projects and sort of ongoing themes that, that, the, that the, the initiative does, and there's a whole bunch of people involved. Um, but my role has been developing a podcast for the for the for the initiative so um it's called renaissance lab not so subtle plug and i look for <laughs> scientists who also do art and artists who use science in their work and basically just to help them tell their stories and explain how a show will basically just show how art and science are essentially attacking the same question from different angles and how you can elevate both by bringing them together oh cool i'm gonna have to dig into yeah. that i love that yeah that'd be cool yeah it's really <laughs> interesting so like i didn't you know i was sort of i think similar to a lot of people you know like you, education here at least in canada it's like okay you have art classes and you have science classes and by the time you get to like high school it's like okay well you got to pretty much pick like are you a science kid or are you an art kid or whatever right yeah and then by the time you're in university like the last art class I took was like in the seventh grade, maybe. And so I'm like, okay, well, I do science and stuff. I do numbers and equations and protocols and pipetting. So that's my life. <laughs> and then, um, when I encountered Convergence, I actually took a class with them. So they have, it's a really cool thing. They do an interdisciplinary class. So they have neuroscientists from McGill mm -hmm. and fine arts students and design students from Concordia, a different university, mm -hmm. and they bring them together in this year-long class where we like, you know, explore each other's disciplines, but we also, you know, build connections with each other. And at the end, we make like an art piece, a science community, uh, yeah, an art piece that's communicating science. So like, I made this with my, my artist friend, my artist pal, we had this like huge eight foot installation piece of like data points with like pulsating lights. It was so cool, it was Aww. so, so cool. That's amazing. Yeah. And it sort of like woke this like, wait, hold on a minute. Art is like that experience made me a better scientist. Mm -hmm. And so this like whole revelation that, you know, this is a false dichotomy between art and science and that both I think are better when you bring them together. So that's, that's so my, cool. Yeah. My new little, my new little hill to die on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a very honorable hill. I'm, I'm totally into it. <laughs> I I'm, hope so. I'm in it. I'm, I'm into that hill. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> that's cool. So how long has this podcast been going on? 
How so many we, episodes can I binge? Yeah. On? Yeah. I mean, two so far. It's only been okay. two. So that's the thing. Um, I mean, as you know, it's a lot of work to podcast. <laughs> and I had, so backstory here. Back in 2013, I had a podcast with a couple of my friends that went on for like 97 episodes. Oh, we wow. went hard, <laughs> like real hard. And then we huh. burnt out completely. So I'm trying to avoid that <laughs> going forward here. So yeah. we have two episodes so far, but um, I've been trying to establish more of a team to get things stabilized so that I don't have to do all the work forever. Because I sure, am also trying, yeah. to, also trying to write a thesis and, you know, find a yeah. job and <laughs> be a grown up at some point. So When you have spare time, you can write that thesis and yeah. jo- jobs will just appear, I believe. I, this that's is my what my dad thinks. Right? That's what my dad thinks. Yeah, and he's like, "Oh, this time next year you'll be living in a house," and I'm like, "Whose house? Do you know how much debt I have, man? <laughs> like, do you no know somebody? Like, yeah, are you gonna are you gonna give me your house? <laughs> Maybe this is like an arranged scary. marriage thing. This is scary. Oh, oh, good call. I hadn't even thought about that. Yikes! I'll keep an eye open. Yeah, yeah. careful. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah, <laughs> same. My, I think my dad had a job offer before he graduated his undergrad and th- wow. they, just, they just like immediately built a house and it's like, this is just how it was. You just, you know, you graduate and, uh, and then yeah. you become, you become a full human being. Like, well, yeah. So I'm a <laughs> hashtag first gen uh-huh. school kid. So my parents, like they finished high school. Um, and yeah, like, I think they even like, they lived with my one of my grandparents for a little while, but like, you know, they just worked for a little while right out of high school and then eventually just bought a house. And I'm like, well, that's pretty yeah. great. Yeah. Different, different times. It's a whole, yeah, for sure. Whole different thing. I guess they probably also had their own version of different times compared to their parents. So. Oh yeah. 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 I think that's normal for sure. Yeah. But they're starting to get it. I mean, I've been in a PhD long enough. They're kind of like, Oh, okay. Actually yeah. like, I used to use my parents as like practice for science communication stuff. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm trying to explain an idea that's really complicated, I go to them because I mean, they have no science training and try to explain the idea, but it's been so long that they're pretty smart now. They're like, it's, they're, <laughs> they're like mid-level epigeneticists. Wow. <laughs> so, they're so, actually yeah, critiquing they're, they're, your posters for conferences now. Basically. And... Yeah. They're fully, they're fully immersed in it. So I got to find somebody else who has like zero experience. So like you should actually add this school. citation uh yeah I'm like but didn't last time you say this and i'm like guys mm-hmm. <laughs> purge your memory of anything i told you mm-hmm. <laughs> you'll have to find uh, i don't know yeah <laughs> new old people to talk <laughs> new, to. <laughs> new old people just go on the street find some new old people be yeah. right. mm-hmm. the new old people that's that'll be fun <laughs> uh yeah okay so uh i think that's uh i was gonna ask if you had projects that uh you're excited to talk about but we we definitely dove into that and yeah i'm excited to dive into your projects now and see what you're Mm. see what you're doing (laughs) me too i'm Uh, excited to have more time for that as well yeah i guess i have a, a quick question about the podcast how much like uh editing and stuff do you tend to do for yours is it like one of those npr style things where you have like a narrator and you chop up interviews and stuff like that a little a little bit of chopping okay. yeah it's um like an intro and an outro that's just sort of me doing my little narration thing and then occasionally yeah. i will did i do it in the last episode i'm not sure but occasionally i'll just like jump in for a quick like clarification but ah, for the most okay. part it's just interview yeah Just yeah a that <laughs> anything more than that seems unbelievably time consuming yeah and like the standards now like you know what is common is mm-hmm. to have like a team of people constantly doing like yeah yeah it's, it's a lot yeah anybody can in theory start a podcast but uh you gotta know what you're getting yourself into <laughs> yes yeah for me, the longest is the like sitting and like, like editing out all the hedges and ums and spaces oh. and stuff. Yeah. I've I like got... to keep it in. I... <laughs> Good. <laughs> I keep good. it in. Keep Why it not? as authentic as possible. Mm-hmm. People love the ums. It doesn't upset people at all. <laughs> to a degree. 
probably. I like this to also uh, generally eat while I'm I'm talking to people. I haven't this time because oh. I'm not hungry, but I like to like chew on an apple. Really? Well, I'm no. <laughs> okay, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to listen to your other episodes then. <laughs> the misophonia is real. Oh here. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Just get all that that the nice mouth noise. Oh yeah, the popping. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of all I had to had to go on for the this this one. I, I really appreciate all your answers. This was really fun. Yeah, I'm so happy I got to talk to you. And like, yeah, it was great to meet you. You too. Um, any chance you would uh, come on after the uh, the conference to do a sort of yeah, part two? Sure. What have we learned? Kind of. I do love a good follow up. Yeah. I mean that that way we get two uh, episodes. Yeah. It's yes. uh, it's efficient. Yep. I am totally down. I'm Great. excited to see what they give us programming wise too. Like Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't actually seen the any sort of talk of what No. That's not yet. They're keeping it a secret. Yeah. Keep suspense high, you know? Yeah. I'm I'm hoping for a, a, like a diversity panel. I went to one of these last uh, fall in the states near like Washington D.C. area, mm-hmm. and I think that was like the biggest like eye-opening takeaway. Um, mm-hmm. Especially doing it in the states, it seems like they have a lot more. Um, they've put a lot, a lot more people are working towards diversity and equity and and things like this, and they have a lot more. Um, like money and infrastructure around that more organizations mm-hmm. working towards mm-hmm. it um yeah and seeing the kind of things that they're working on at all times and how engaged they are in in that sort of process i'd like to see what canada has to yeah to offer in that sense yeah for sure or like what gaps there are that you know we should be thinking about that uh you know we can help with or whatever yeah but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. We'll see what uh, we'll see what they have for us. I'm excited. Mm-hmm. Anyway, thanks so much for coming on the show. This thanks was for great. Me. I, I agree. Uh, I can't wait to join you and the rest of the people virtually and uh, learn yeah. a lot. And I'll definitely check out your uh, your work. And I'll cool. plug anything. If uh, yeah, if you have any other links and stuff that you'd like me to share, um, I'll definitely do that in the show notes. I'll. Sounds whatever. good. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'll send you my website, send you my yeah. Twitter, all that stuff. <laughs> cool. Awesome. awesome. Thanks so much. And of course, I'll, I'll let you know when this goes up. And mm-hmm. um, yeah. Cool. Be great. Thanks fun. so much. Have a thank you. Have a great week. Thanks. You too. <laughs> Is it also like hotter than balls where you are too? I have one room that has an air conditioning unit and it's not this one. <laughs> no, it is, no. Yeah, neither is this one. I had to get away warm. from it so it didn't just sound like an air conditioner on your podcast, but yeah. yeah. I'd yeah, wear my yeah, thickest it's... shirt so I, I wouldn't visibly sweat through it. Yeah. This is like a... <laughs> that's the thing. Well, see, that's why my camera is just like, just here up, right? Because I'm just like fully gross down here. Just fully sweaty mess. I'm sitting in a kiddie pool, actually. It's uh, <laughs> it's quite nice. <laughs> Oh, that would be great. But it's oh, uh, not very professional, as they say. Mm. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, I'm going to actually go jump in my kiddie pool. I'll be <laughs> Sounds good. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you later. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, bye. Bye.